Hello, my name is Grant Kramer, and I'm a professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. Today, I'm sitting in front of Chateau Complicade near saint emilion in the Bordeaux region of France. It's a beautiful place and a beautiful area with great wines and wonderful grapes. Today, I'm going to talk to you about leaf structure and plant identification. So grape leaves come in a variety of shapes um, and we characterize them by several different factors. So on the left here, we can see we have a petiole, we have a large varied leaf blade. And these leaf blades are sometimes completely round, but in other cases have lobes on them and different numbers of lobes and they have these indentations, which are called um, sinuses. So we have a petiolar sinus right near where the petiole attaches. And this is often a very significant identification mark on the terms of the way the shape is. It could be a U shape as in this case, or it could be a V shape or even flatter. We have these lateral sinuses as well. So we count the number of lobes and then the other particular characteristic that's important is the margin of the leaf. Sometimes those leaves are smooth, sometimes they're known as teeth, as in this picture here of a Merlot grape leaf, or sometimes they're deeper, more serrated. So these are the characteristics or attributes that you're looking for when you're um, trying to identify a grape variety. Uh, the um, Leaf venation is also quite striking, and you can see that these veins go quite a, quite a ways all throughout the leaf, and ultimately close to all the plant cells. Um, so here's a cross section of a leaf, just to give you an idea of what a grape leaf is like. We have a upper epidermal layer here that is completely closed off, whereas we have a lower epidermal layer here where we have our stomates, the stomatal pores, which open and close and let CO2 into the leaf and water outside the leaf. This is controlled by the guard cell. So we only have stomatal pores on the lower epidermis of the leaf or the abaxial side of the leaf. We have additional cell types in here. Um, this is the palisade cells. These are dense cells where most of the photosynthesis is going on. Very little is going on in the epidermal layer. And we have another type of photosynthetic cell called the spongy mesophyll cells. These are much more loosely packed so that the CO2 can diffuse into these air spaces and photosynthesis can occur. And then right here we see, um, which is hard to make out in this um, cross section, but it's vascular tissue. That is the xylem and phloem piping is coming in from below through the petiole to the leaf and providing water and allowing sugars from these photosynthetic cells to be pumped back out to the rest of the plant. So leaf shape varies quite a bit. Uh, you can see it here in a few examples. Here we have a Cabernet Sauvignon leaf, which has five lobes and it has deep sinuses um, and deep serrations. And here over here, we have a Chardonnay leaf, which has got very little sinuses whatsoever. There's a large petiolar sinus here, but we don't have such distinct lobes, but there are lobes. And you can see the margins here are more tooth-like. Uh, here are two wild species. This is Vitus riparia which is a, from the Northeastern United States. And again, you can see the lobes are not uh, so distinct. Um, there are, in a sense, five lobes here, but very, very short. And then notice the petiolar sinus is much more open and round. And here is a um, Vitus uh, champignii, or commercially known as Ramsey, comes from, originates from the Texas area. And you can see deeper um, sinuses here. Again, a very distinct, almost V-shaped sinus here. 
um, in, in the petiolar sinus. So these are ways of identifying um, different species as well as different cultivars. The science of identifying grapevines by leaf shape and by the color of the grape clusters um, and the shape and size of the grape clusters is known as ampelography. Um, this is a very difficult work to, to do because there's so much variation in, in, in varieties, um, in cultivars, and on a single plant, you can see variation in, in leaf shape just on a single shoot from the bottom to the top. That makes it very hard to identify. And in fact, um, in our own vineyard, uh, we had uh, some Pinot Blanc leaves that um, I um, began to think were Chardonnay leaves, or the other way around, I guess it was. Uh, I had Chardonnay leaves that I thought looked like Pinot Blanc leaves, and I wondered if there had been a misidentification. So we sent the pictures down to Davis, to Dr. Andy Walker, and he seemed to con confer that it looked like uh, these might actually be Pinot Blanc um, leaves rather than, than Chardonnay. Uh, so to, to be sure of that, we sent some leaf samples down where they did some DNA testing, only to find out that indeed they were Chardonnay leaves. So even the experts can be fooled. And this leads me to a funny story. Uh, when I was in Chile for the first time, uh, we were touring around Chile and my colleague down there was telling us a story about Merlot and Carmenere in Chile. So for many, many years, the um, industry was making grapes, making wine from grapes that they called Merlot grapes. Uh, and for about 20 years, they were selling it around the world as Merlot. Only to have a very famous French empelographer come down to visit their vineyards and show them these wonderful Merlot grapes. Um, and he looked at them and he said, those aren't Merlot grapes. And they went, well, if it isn't, well, what is it? And he said, I don't know. And eventually, 10 years later, a, uh, another ampelographer, young French ampelographer, came down to identify it as Carmenere grapes, which was a very rare old French grape variety that was not growing much in France anymore. But the vineyards were large amounts of them in Chile. So now you see wine being sold pretty much only from Chile of Carmenere. Now here's an example down there. On the left up here we have a Merlot um, leaf and down below is a Carmenere leaf. And I have my beautiful assistant here, my wife, um, holding those leaves next to each other. And now use your training that you just had to look at the sinuses, the shape of the sinuses, and the leaf margins, and tell me which grape leaf is Merlot and which grape leaf is Carmenere. I'll give you one second or two or three or four to decide. The answer is the left one is Carmenere and the right one was Merlot. How did you do? It's not easy, is it? Okay, so um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how genetic small genetic variations can make big differences in grapes. Um, Pinot Noir is an old, old variety going back at least to 900 AD um, in France and has given rise through mutations to a number of different genotypes, some of which we call cultivars, some of which are clones. I don't know what the difference is between a cultivar and a clone and how one decides that this is to be a cultivar and not a clone because in this case, between Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, it's a single gene mutation that causes this large difference in leaf shape and somewhat differences in the clusters. 
There have been other spontaneous mutations that have occurred in the field that growers have identified, uh, which have led to the development, propagation. So they have a mutation on a vine, they see it, they cut it off, and they start propagating that mutation. And that's how these are generated. The same thing happens in apples. But in this case, Pinot Gris has a lighter color in its cluster. Uh, and often we make that as a white wine because we press it off the grapes very quickly to prevent the extraction of color out of the skin. And again, you can see the leaf shape is similar, but has its own differences and unique differences. And again, we have Pinot Blanc, a white grape that comes from Pinot Noir. So this is a mutation um, and a transcription factor that affects the synthesis of anthocyanins and it knocks it out and it no longer produces um, red color in the grapes, but only produces a green color or white, white grape. And this has happened many times in other grape varieties as well um, over the years as independent mutations that have knocked out this particular transcription factor that affects the biosynthesis of anthocyanins. But you can see that leaf shape is also affected. So there are many, many genetic variations as a result of these mutations. Remember, grape breeding does not produce consistent genotypes, so we have to vegetatively propagate the grape that we want because the grape itself, the genome is too heterozygous and we won't get the, if we cross Pinot Noir with Pinot Noir, we will not get a Pinot Noir uh, genotype out of those seedlings. So the definitive way to identify grapes, which is much more um, consistent and, and uh, accurate, is to use DNA testing that we have today. So, this involves DNA sequencing as well. Um, and this is a revolution that's going on right now in, in this century. Um, it's really contributing to our fundamental and deep understanding of biology. The grape genome was, still, was first sequenced in 2007. There have been many other now grape varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, which I had a part in, that have um, been sequenced. It allows for understanding what the precise nucleotide sequence is for each genotype, including any clonal variants. So clonal variants may only have uh, a single gene, single nucleotide mutation, or uh, a, what we call SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms that cause variation in the size of the cluster or the density or compactness of the, of the cluster. Um, whether it has wings on the cluster or not. There are lots of variations that go on in clones that still make it the same cultivar. This technology, this DNA sequencing technology is, has been changing very rapidly. And so the cost of sequencing has come down dramatically. Uh, pretty soon you'll probably be getting your own DNA tested. I've already had mine done. I've, I've had my sequence done uh, and it will be used for medical uh, uses in the future for a very personalized medicine. It's a very, very exciting time. But typically, DNA fingerprinting is um, a cruder form of this, where the DNA is extracted, then it's fragmented into pieces of DNA um, using what we call restriction enzymes that cut the DNA in certain nucleotide sequences. And since those sequences vary with different genotypes, it cuts them in different pieces uh, or different lengths of pieces. And these fragments can be run on a gel by electrophoresis, a type of technique that moves those sequences by size through the gel. And the pattern is unique for each cultivar. And thus we have what we call a fingerprint of that cultivar. Here's an example of that on which um, we have different cultivars along the top here, and we can stain the DNA and we can see the fragments um, links are similar in some genotypes and different in others. 
and you can line this up just like a fingerprint and um, identify what the cultivar is. Unfortunately, it does not distinguish clones very well. And so this method really can only be used to distinguish cultivars. Such findings have led to some interesting understandings. So for example, um, Chardonnay comes from two parents, Pinot or Pinot Noir and Gouy Blanc, which was considered a poor quality grape in France. And so the prestigious Chardonnay came from a lesser quality parent, which was shocking to the French when this was discovered. Um, and Pinot and Gouy Blanc have given rise to other um, genotypes as well, Oligote and Gamay Noir, and 13 other varieties have come from this um, spontaneous crossing in, in the field. So this was not deliberate work done by breeders. This was just spontaneous discoveries by people out in the field that happened naturally. As remember, pollination can be, be on a self-fertilization of the flower, but wind or insects can also carry pollen to other genotypes and cause a spontaneous or natural cross. Another interesting discovery was that the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon are Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And this is again uh, a natural occurrence that occurred in the fields in Bordeaux somewhere. And then finally, through a sort of genetic detective test, uh, it was discovered that Zindendel actually um, originated from Croatia and was carried down to southern Italy, where it was then brought to the United States. And the grape variety that we call Permitivo is essentially the same as Zinfandel. Um, some people call it a clone of Zinfandel or vice versa. Here's just a, a map. I don't expect you to see this or understand it, but it's a map of the Pinot pedigree as determined by geneticists using this technique. So there are lots of different genotypes arising from this original parentage and um, uh, gives us the diversity that we see. There are over 7,500 different grapevine genotypes today um, and it continues to grow. So finally, uh, in this last slide, I just wanna talk about a futuristic technology that is here today. Um, and this is called GBS for short, or genotype by sequencing. Um, it's a targeted sequencing. So we're sequencing the nucleotides, but we're only sequencing certain parts of the genome rather than sequencing the whole genome. This makes it more cost effective. And what we're looking for are these single nucleotide polymorphisms, just a single difference in a nucleotide sequence that is specific to a clone or a cultivar to identify, to identify the genotypes. This methodology is being established and has been used to identify grapevines. Um, I'm not sure that it's commercially available at this point in time, but I expect it will be in the future. So I hope you found this uh, talk informative and you go out now and look in your vineyard at the leaves of your grapevines and look at the variation on a single vine and or look at variation in, and leaves between different vines. And know that if you really, really want to know what grape variety you have, you need to have uh, your DNA sequenced uh, and identified for that, for that genome. UC Davis does perform that methodology um, and can identify your genotype if you're concerned. I am not sure what the cost is. Uh, so thank you and have a good day.